Hello, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Thank you so much for tuning in to another very special edition of the Notion at Work webcast. I am William Nutt of Nutt Labs. We're an integrated digital strategy firm and Notion consultancy. And I also run the independent website Notion VIP, where I publish tools and insights about all things Notion. You can access that at notion.vip and find me on Twitter at William Nutt. And today we are once again joined by our regular guest host, August Bradley, who's going to walk us through his advanced system for managing sales. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with August, he's uh, he's a regular guest here on the Notion at Work webcast and publishes all sorts of really useful and insightful content about Notion um, and just productivity systems in general. So what we'll do is August will walk through his system. I'll keep an eye on the chat and on the uh, ask a question feature down at the bottom of Crowdcast. But for the most part, we'll do Q&A after August's walkthrough. Um, but if anything is really timely, any or anything urgent emerges, I'll I'll stop August and we'll address it um, right then. So um, with that, August, thank you so much for joining us and uh, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, William. And as always, it's such a privilege to be here. I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to join you in this amazing community over here at the Notion at Work series. So that's always fun. Um, I, yeah, I typically teach a, a life operating system using Notion on how to enhance and empower your life through systems and processes, leveraging Notion and uh, bringing in alignment between your high level goals and your hour to hour focus. And that's typically what I present. Today's going to be a little bit different because we're going to look at sort of a separate module that completely stands alone. This is for small businesses or really any business uh, that involves sales and cultivating leads and, and bringing in new clients. So it's going to emphasize more service oriented. So it's not necessarily going to be a, a, say a SaaS product that would be much more automated. This is a more manual cultivating leads bringing in clients and then serving your clients. So we'll talk through that. But this really stands on its own, independent of my pillars, pipelines, and vaults, uh, life operating system. So just think of this as a, a, a module that's entirely self-operating in whatever system or platform that you're working within. So with that, let's dive in. And I'll give you an overview on how I think it, I, I, what I think is a really effective way to go about cultivating leads and sales and, and tracking your progress. And I just want to say at the outset, the, the element that I think is most important here that I don't see in many sales tracking systems, because there are plenty of them and there's some overlap between all of them. But what I rarely see is a mechanism built in for reflection, for learning. So what I want to ultimately uh, lead, lead to in this conversation is how you study what you're doing, review what's working, review what's not working and then digest and reassess so that you're constantly learning. You're not just going through the motions, running through numbers and plowing through call and lead and outreach after outreach. Instead, you're really studying and watching what's working and what's not working and refining as you go. So with that in mind, let's dive in. All right, so we have the full screen on the, on the Notion system here, great. So this is the dashboard I have for sales and marketing. This is a template and this isn't exactly what I do. My search situation has become kind of unique. <laughs> so I'm not doing a lot of direct outreach, but I did for many years. And so this is based on a lot of the things that I used to do and some of it's still relevant, but I think this is more relevant to most people, especially when you're starting out, whether you're a solo freelancer or whether you're a small team building a clientele. So. I, one of the best things in Notion is the ability to build dashboards where there's a central hub for everything related. And this would be what I would uh, consider a sales and marketing dashboard for this purpose. Now I'm gonna walk through two main areas, the sales outreach area and the lead generation area uh, in more detail. That's really going, to, really going to be the main focus of today's session. But before I dive into that, I just wanted to highlight the bottom layer, level here. And what I have going on down here is, a, is three different self-referencing filtered uh, database views, each in table form. And these are leveraging what we talked about the last time I was on Notion at Work, where I talked about the knowledge management system. So we talked about having notes and ideas database that captures your thoughts and your ideas, 
cap a media vault that's capturing your articles and videos and podcasts where you're taking notes and capturing information. And then the knowledge vault where you have everything organized by topic, the topics you want to learn and grow in and want to get better and more knowledgeable in, you're cultivating these different topics. And if you jump back to that episode, if you haven't seen it, you'll see how this was all set up for these three to work together. But what we're doing here in the sales and marketing dashboard is we now have them filtered by those that have tags for sales and marketing. So all the notes and ideas that were tagged to sales and marketing are now resurfacing in context in the sales and marketing dashboard, which is super valuable because that's where these notes become actionable and useful. So um, notes and ideas is all about quick capture and then resurfacing at the right time and right place. And this is an example of all these notes and ideas. These are, this is obviously a test uh, database that I use for demonstrations, but this is showing how you can have them resurface at the right time and right place in Notion very effectively. Then with media, these are articles, videos, podcasts we're capturing, and they also are filtered for the sales and marketing tag. So all the sales and marketing articles, podcasts, videos, and such are resurfacing in the right place at the right time. And each of these are also uh, sorted by a last edited. So most recently touched in any way are at the top descending. And then finally, the knowledge vault. These are by topics. These are topics that I'm actively engaged in that are important that I'm learning more about and collecting information about that are also tagged to, in this case, marketing. I didn't have a sales one, but if I were capturing a lot of developing active sales knowledge, I would probably have a separate one for sales or maybe a combined sales and marketing. Either way, the tags for sales and marketing is filtering and resurfacing all of this knowledge and information right here where I need it most. So that's a super valuable way to leverage Notion to build a very functional dashboard. But getting into the system and process for sales, let's start with sales outreach. Sales outreach is where you're proactively reaching out to people, you're building a list of people you wanna contact, and you're going through the process of reaching out to them, introducing yourself, getting to know them a little bit, hopefully making some kind of connection on a personal level. And then if there's a fit and a need, you can migrate that conversation to potentially serving their business needs. So the way we do this is, you start by building lists, lists of people you want to reach out to. Now, potentially, you might want to start by listing companies you want to reach out to. So you might build a company database. Uh, and there's some overlap with this with the uh, CRM session that William did a few episodes ago. So that one actually goes into much more detail. I'm going to be looking at this in a very streamlined way of how to apply it to the process of cultivating leads and clients. So similar to that one, we have a company, what, he called the, what William called the brand database I'm calling target companies because we're specifically listing the companies that would be relevant to the services or products we're providing. So we're going to make a list of these companies and then we're going to make a list of people either if we're targeting companies, then we'll then after we target the companies, look into those companies and see who is running the departments that are relevant for us. And in many cases, it's less about targeting companies, it's more about targeting individuals. Many of our businesses, especially if you're a freelancer or a very small business, you'll often be targeting other freelancers or other small businesses, and it might be more about the person. So either way, think about what makes more sense for your product or service, to, to go out hunting and researching companies that would be a good fit, or to go out hunting individuals. And that's the process would be similar in terms of building those target lists, but the places you might look for them are different. Typically, if you're looking for individuals, LinkedIn tends to be the, the go-to first to mind source for cultivating those, although that can be good for companies as well. In terms of companies, you know your niche better than, you, or you should know your niche very well. If you don't know your niche, you, should, you need to research your niche. But as you go through that research of understanding the niche of the service and products you offer, you're going to come across companies that are active in that space or individuals. Either way, as you're doing the research, even before you're thinking sales, you should just be compiling lists of every player, of every organization that's active in your space. And this is where you start compiling those names for companies and individuals so that you can then make a very specific outreach and start building relationships for the purpose of sales. So in the target contact list, which is the list of individuals, which again, you might cultivate from internal employees of a larger company, or you might just be targeting it directly. Now, this is going to be the action list because obviously you can't reach out to a company 
you have to reach out to an individual within the company. So ultimately, this is the actionable list. Now, if your list is very much comprised of, com of individuals and not companies, there's no not necessarily a need to have a entire database for companies. That's if you are inclined to have multiple people within the same company, then you want a separate database for companies and you'll be able to have rollups that bring information from the company into it. If you typically only have one contact at every company, in fact, if you always do that, then you don't need the company database at all. You can just have the individual and you would just enter their company because you don't need to have that efficiency of the company information rolling in. You're only entering it once and you might as well just enter it with the individual. So that kind of depends on your circumstance. That's an opportunity to simplify this slightly. But ultimately, it all comes down to your contact, your target contact list, which is what we have here. Let's take a look at this in a little more detail. And these are really simple databases. So this is not challenging Notion stuff. Uh, so, but if you have technical questions on how to build this in the Q and A, let's dive into that. I'm happy to get into the nuts and bolts of assembly. So you're going to list everybody by name, and then critically, you're going to have status, which is going to be a single select, and then you're going to list the sequence with which they go through the process of getting of identifying uh, of identifying them initially, which would put them in the queue, then doing your first outreach to them. If you don't hear back, you do a second outreach. You probably don't want to get too obsessive with subsequent outreaches. Make one or two and then let it go. You don't want to be the, that annoying guy on LinkedIn that's just overdoing it. But the initial outreach, and that's an art form into itself. Often, I think it's better not, you definitely don't want to reach out with a pitch. You want to reach out with some connection, some common interest. Uh, ideally, ideally, you'd have a referral or an intro. That's going to be listed over here. If someone you know also knows this person, then they're going to make an intro a referral, or at least you can say such and such recommended I get in touch with you. And you're going to list that in the database too. Who is the common person you know who could do an intro or, or, or referral? And then after that, if they reply, then it moves to the replied state. And you're going to be obviously moving these through the sequence as you go. And then, then you get into a point where you have some back and forth, you're in discussion. Ultimately, in most cases, with most services, you're going to want to set up a call because that's going to be just a faster way of introducing what you do, getting to understand their needs, which is ultimately what all, what sales is all about, is really understanding the client's needs and then talking with them about how you can solve their problem. And we'll get more into that in a moment. Uh, then follow up. Basically, you have the sequence with which they go through and ultimately end up in, as, as either a client where you win the business or you lose them in terms of a lead, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It could become a new relationship and they could potentially open more doors or they could just become someone worth knowing independently of the sales opportunity. So all of this is worth tracking. If you hit circle back, that just means you had a call or you had a discussion, you did some follow up and nothing ever came of it. You weren't able to get the call. You weren't able to get any commitment. And so it's not a yes, it's not a no. You just put it in circle back. That means you'll revisit it down the road. Uh, generally though, consider no answer is a no in terms of sales. So what you're really going for is a confirmed yes. Now, after you do the sales call, the sales call is particularly important in this process. That's really the make or break. That's where it happens or it doesn't happen. So you want to put a lot of emphasis on learning from the sales call when you get to that point. So when you do the sales call, after that, you're going to rate the sales call one through five. Uh, you, I mean, I typically make a one the best and a five the worst, but whatever. Make a one through five rating so that you can measure what was successful in terms of your assessment of the call and what was not. And then later you're going to see how those line up with wins and losses. And then we're going to inside the workspace do a debrief on each call and get more, extract more learning from the process of the sales call. So we will revisit that once we get inside these, these uh, workspaces or these uh, pages. Uh, so you enter the referral, you enter the source of where you found them. Was it when you were you know, combing through LinkedIn? Was it in a Facebook professional group or a Facebook group of some sort, conference, keynotes, any context? You, whatever the context where you discover the person, that's useful to enter here. It helps you jog your memory and it becomes a potential point of reference in your conversation, especially if it's something more specific, like a conference keynote or something like that. Obviously, you want their company. Right here, we're linking to the company database. But again, if every 
if you really only have one person for each company, then you don't necessarily need a separate database if you want to simplify. Uh, right here, we're rolling up from the company database, the city and the website. Obviously, you can roll up any information associated with the company if you're doing a separate database. Uh, then email, then you know, the contact information. You want it readily available. So when you sit down to do your outreach, you are ready to go. You've done the list building. List building is a separate stage or a separate step from the outreach itself. When you sit down to do the outreach, you want to be able to plow through them and go through them quickly and focus completely on that communication, not be research, send message, research, send message. You want to research them all, make your list, build your list, and then you're going to sit down for an hour or two or three or whatever it takes and reach out to people. So you want all the contact information here. If you have the email, that's often the, the best initial outreach, but sometimes you don't have that. You may be reaching out through LinkedIn. So you're going to paste the LinkedIn contact here, their, uh, the link to their profile. In all of these, the email, the LinkedIn, the Twitter, actually we have LinkedIn twice, don't we? Uh, delete that, are links. So these are quick access to go to them. Now you can set up an email as a link. So this is set up. So if I click that, it'll go to the, my mail application. And that's a great feature with the Notion. Notion, if you enter the email, it func in a URL. So this is set up as a URL property. If you do that and enter an email, it'll automatically enter or open and get your, e your email send page ready for you with that email address. So that's something that's a little nice touch that most people don't know about. Emails work as URLs. And then if you're going through LinkedIn or Twitter, those are the other two common ways you'd reach out to someone that you don't know, and you'd have those links right there. So you build it all out with all the information. So when you sit down to reach out, you're going boom email, boom LinkedIn, or boom Twitter, uh, or whatever other platform you might reach out. And then you're going to set the date here for the initial contact, the initial day you reached out. That's just a helpful to sort and to organize sometimes. Uh, and we're going to come back to this. This is a link to the other database that is set up here. This is the sales and communication tracking database. So these are all of your calls and messages, and you're going to enter every communication you have with them with each person on your list in this database. So typically, you're going to always, you're going to put the date, you're going to link to the contact in the contact, the target contact database, the one we were just in. You're going to indicate what type of communication it is, whether it's a video call, phone call, email, Twitter, DM, or what have you. Uh, you can have their email, which here is rolling up along with the contacts. Unfortunately, rollups don't link, but you want to have it here anyway, just as part of the, the record. And then the outcome, whether that was actually something that led to a, a, uh, a deal closing or not, often it's not going to be uh, conclusive. So many of these just won't be filled out. Many of these will just be blank. But if it does lead to a conclusion, you want to indicate that that was the communication that closed the deal. That's useful information. And then, of course, the source through, uh, through which that communication took place. And this is going to circle back when we get into the pages. So back to the target contact list, which is our primary list here. Now we're going to go inside of the first one, Jamie asked. Of course, you'd have the full name. But I was just entering dummy names for the sake of this example. We'll open this up. And we have a template down here. I'll show you the template in a moment. But right here, we have a database bringing in all of our communication with Jamie. Now, there's just one because I just have a few samples entered. But we are filtering by, of course, self-referencing filter for the sales and communication tracking database to the person in the target contact database. And then we're going to sort by date descending. So the date of the communication descending, so most recent at the top. So you're going to have the whole history of your communication record with that person, which is super valuable. You're also going to have a place here for notes, and the notes will be dated. So we have a little page button that generates any new notes. You do that. It's going to give you a toggle where you can enter that. All you do is type at enter. At enter will give you today's date because the default when you type in at is today. So you hit, when you hit at, you'll see the default that comes up is today. You don't even have to type today. For any other date, you have to start typing it, and then you can select it. But for today, just type at. And today, you have a note. And here, by doing these notes and toggles, you can open multiple notes together and see them together. That's the advantage of the toggles over doing this in a database because you can open them and see them together.
or in any in any combination. So you can add any notes. Any note you add, you're going to add a new toggle here, add the date just with the at sign, and enter the note here. And then after you do a call, a sales call, you're going to do a call review. This is where that rating of one through five comes in. You're going to look at later, you're going to study what were the, the ones, what were the twos, what were the threes, what were the fours and fives. And you're going to, for each call you do, each sales call. Now, sales calls are an art form unto themselves and could be a whole program. But <laughs> uh, just for the sake, and that's something worth studying. But for the sake of this tracking system, you're going to enter the length of the call. You're going to enter whether you followed the outline, you typically have an outline you have for the sales calls, did, and how did it deviate, what worked, what didn't work, and key learnings. So you're going to do that for every single sales call you do. And then later, you're going to review by success rate what, which, what commonalities came up under different scenarios. Uh, now I see we're running longer in time than I had expected to, to go through this. So let me jump ahead. So that's going to give you everything you need to track the sales process. Then down here, we have a status board, which will present by status category where everything is in the pipeline. So we've got, just as we saw before, first, this is the target contact list filtered view of first outreach, second outreach, replied in discussion, called, uh, call is scheduled, follow up after the call, and circle back. And you see where everybody is. And of course, you can move everybody through the pipeline, but you see who's in queue, who needs to get initial outreach, who needs second outreach. And this is a great way to track it. It tucks nicely, so you have a very clean board. Now, quickly, one, one approach is to do the direct outreach and just start making your list and reaching out to people. But it's also nice to have some leads coming in. And there are a couple ways to do that. And typically, you have to take the initiative to put yourself out there, to put your ideas out there in order to have leads start coming in. And, we and I've got a little system here that's good for tracking and putting that in motion. So first, we have the content reach plan. This is a table that just sort of maps out your game plan and your intention. It's, sort, it's very similar to what I've presented elsewhere as a habits and routines uh, table. It's not a dynamic table. It's more just formatting so you can see what your intentions are. You're going to list the platforms you want to engage communities on. And it doesn't have to be all of them. It could be one. It could be two. It could be five or eight. Be careful not to bite off too much at the beginning because it's hard. It's hard to keep up with this. But make a list of the platforms where people congregate in your target niche. And so if that could be certain Facebook groups. It could uh, You could be putting stuff out on YouTube and trying to attract attention through the YouTube search alg algorithm. Uh, Twitter, of course. Instagram, LinkedIn, newsletter, podcast. So you're going to identify how frequently you, the ones that you're prioritizing, how frequently you're going to engage with those. Uh, so, so Facebook groups, you may identify two or three groups in your niche. And you may say, I'm going to make three, three times a week, I'm going to go into these groups and share some insight or answer some questions, somehow engage and add some value. Uh, you're not pitching, you're not doing sales pitches here, you're becoming a member of these communities, a valuable member who's contributing ideas and help to people. Uh, but and that's how you become known in those communities. Uh, YouTube, you may start putting out videos on your topic, in which case you're going to want to have a schedule. How frequently? If you do it once a week. And then, of course, you can do the routine. So if you're going to do three group posts in Facebook groups a week, you want to identify the days. Make it a strict routine that you follow consistently. That's how you deliver the results because all of this requires consistency. None of this works if you do it ad hoc in rare occasions. You need to be consistent. So you set a plan for Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings. I'm going to do some Facebook group contributions. Tuesday mornings, I'm going to put out a video. And this could be simple. This doesn't have to be a, a slick presentation. This could be an iPhone sharing some thoughts on a topic. Uh, Twitter, I'm going to tweet once a day, Monday through Friday. That's a goal you might set for yourself on the topics that you're looking to become a part of the conversation in. Or you could do it once a week. I mean, there's no requirement on what you do. The requirement is that you're consistent in whatever you choose to do. But the more you're out there, a part of these communities, the more people are going to know you and the more leads are just going to come in. Of course, part of this is setting up your profile so that it's clear what you do. That's a bigger conversation than what we're looking at here and just tracking sales efforts. But in terms of tracking, we want to clearly identify the consistent program you're going to be on. And this table is where you lay it out. I should, I should probably 
make this bigger. I hope that wasn't too small for you guys to see. So you get the idea. This is very simple. Then you're going to attract the number of followers you get. Don't obsess over this. It's nice to get a measure of the level of engagement and whether it's rising. That's why I have estimated average likes per post or per, per contribution, estimated average comments uh, or replies. Don't obsess over this. The point is not to obsess. The point is to be consistent. What matters is the consistent engagement on your part and the, the value that you add. So the mindset of going in and offering value, being of service to people, you're not pitching. You want them to see you offering so much value that they go that they then go look up your profile and your profile is where it's going to state what you do. And that's how you generate leads. So you set out your plan and then you do daily tracking. This is a habit tracker, but this is a habit tracker for business sales efforts. So you have the Facebook groups across the top. Of course, each day you're going to enter for that day. And then you're going to have all the platforms you want to be engaged in on a regular basis. And you're going to track it. Facebook groups. We decided we were going to do Mondays and Fridays. Or if or Monday, I think it was Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So check that off. Whatever. You're going to and then you each day you engage with the Facebook groups. You're going to come here and check that off. YouTube, each day you do a post or post a video, you're going to put it there. Twitter, each day you contribute, not just randomly, but specifically with knowledge and help in your field. You're going to check off that you did a tweet that day. Or if your goal is to do three tweets a day, then you have to do three before you check it off. LinkedIn, I contributed to some LinkedIn conversations. Check it off. And you're going to track this just the way you track your fitness goals and your other habits. You're going to track your sales tracking. Now, if you're doing, if you're a one-person operation and you have a personal tracker for your other habits, put this in with that one. But if you're part of a team or you're sharing this with others as part of a professional effort, then make it a separate daily tracker just for business and sales. Anyway, just, the key is just to track that you're delivering upon the goals you had set for yourself in this table. And then finally, if you're going to be producing more than just comments or replies, then you want to create a content production schedule. This goes back to my whole template here on content production, which is way beyond the scope of today's talk. But there are, in fact, one of my templates in my template pack is this whole content production plan. If you wanted to produce more than just jumping into, whoop, that's not where I wanted to go, more than just jumping into conversations and participating in group chats, but actually producing content, that is, of course, another great way to generate leads. So with that, I'm going to leave it to questions. We can go in any direction you want, but we've got two parts, direct outreach and lead generation, where you try to create incoming inquiries. And the two can go nicely, or you can go all in one or all in the other. Uh, the key is that you do something. So William, let's look, open it up to questions Incredible and see where August. the audience wants to go. Yeah. Thank you so much. As usual, this is so much more about <laughs> uh, so much more than just staying organized, but actually bolstering, you know, sales and, and lead generation performance. So no surprise here, but thank you so much for for delivering this really enhanced sales system. So with that, we will, um, as you say, let the questions kind of drive the direction of the conversation. We will use the ask a question feature down at the bottom of Crowdcast to determine um, the most popular questions. So add yours there. And if you see any that appeal to you, uh, upvote it. So it will uh, be sent to the top. So the first one we have here is, uh, would this template be available for the general audience? <laughs> yes. In fact, I meant to get it ready, but I didn't quite get it ready before we started. So uh, I'll have it. I'll put this in my template pack by the end of the day. So I apologize. It's not already there. That was my intention. But I will put this template in my, my standard template pack, which we can link to. I think we can link to that, William. It's it's, yeah, yeah, we'll uh, yeah. we'll have a follow up um, email where you'll have uh, an opportunity to access a lot of the resources that August and I have mentioned here, um, and that's also going to include um, a survey. So um, uh, I'll go ahead and mention that um, we we take a close look at those. So if you have any recommendations or requests uh, for future editions of this webcast from uh, from August and myself, um, we please include them there and we will uh, absolutely get them in to the pipeline. Yeah, and um, you can, and just if you're watching this on YouTube or embedded somewhere, under every single one of my videos on my YouTube channel, there's a link to my template pack, which you get when you subscribe to my free newsletter, which of course you can unsubscribe if you want to, but I hope you'll check that out too. Awesome. Um, okay, so let's see here. Um, 
Danny asked uh, a couple of upvotes on this one. When looking at engagement or content, do you reuse content? Do I, uh, first of all, Danny is a beautiful example of engaging in group conversation. <laughs> indeed, so indeed. Is a perfect uh, case study in terms of executing flawlessly on engaging in group conversations in Facebook groups and Reddits and all over the place. Uh, yeah, so in terms of be two Dannys, he's already got to be using some sort of system like this in order to be <laughs> on top of everything. Yes, brilliant work uh, in that regard, Danny. So the question is how to reuse content. Certainly, if you can now. I think oh, so that could go in a number of directions. We're talking about, say, if you make a YouTube video, would you share pieces of it on another platform like Instagram? Is that what we're getting at? Because, yeah, I mean, yeah, tip, Danny, tip. yeah, and you can uh, you can answer in the chat here, but are you are you referring to repurposing on the same channels and maybe kind of up, updating or refreshing or doing cross channel? Yeah, let me just riff on it while he replies. So if you're actually creating content, then that's a great way to go. The problem is it does take time to repackage and reslice and dice. And different platforms require different formatting of the content in, for, in order to use those platforms effectively. You can't just take a YouTube video and stick it on LinkedIn, for example. So LinkedIn has, well, you could if the YouTube video is short enough. LinkedIn has a 10 minute limit. Instagram has an even shorter limit. I don't even know what it is, but it needs to be a very short clip. Although Instagram tends to be vertical. So if you have the capacity, the bandwidth, to take a marquee piece of client, like a, a lead primary piece of content, and cut it into pieces, take a screenshot, put some text, and you know, put it in a different, you know, take one piece and extract smaller pieces from it. That's fantastic. That's the Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary Vaynerchuk uh, method that he advocates, and it's fantastic if you have the bandwidth for it. But I mean, he has a team, and if you don't have a team. It takes a lot of time to be generating even not not just generating the first one, but then to create the derivatives from it. It's really time consuming. So it just becomes a matter of whether it's realistic with with the scope of the team you have, which in most of our cases is ourselves. Like most of us don't have teams for packaging content. So that's the that's the trade-off, is it just takes time. I think the the key thing is that you prioritize one or two channels up front, probably one initially, and then expand to two slowly and expand to three. You don't do six, seven, eight platforms at once. It's just impossible. You'll do all of them badly. You'll be inconsistent no matter what your intentions are if you do too many and spread yourself too thin. Pick if you for, for content, pick a very pick one channel for content and then maybe eventually expand to two. Now for engaging in community discussions, that's where you can do a lot more broad engagement, you know, earlier. So you might find the key Reddit groups sub, of the subreddits, the key Facebook groups, the key LinkedIn discussion threads. And those you can do consistently across a wider range. So it just depends on the depth of each piece that you're looking at. Yeah, I, I completely agree with all of those recommendations um, and just underscore the importance of multi-purposing your efforts. Whenever I'm publishing any kind of content, um, I'm always really careful to do so in a way that will allow me to to utilize multiple channels to, to get it out there because I don't want to, you know, pour an enormous amount of time into a piece of content that's only going to be distributed to, to one audience uh, through one channel. But to August's point, you know, you do want to be really careful to modify each piece of content to suit the audience and kind of the format of each channel. So you got to find that right balance. Yeah, if um, a single piece does fit across channels, here's an example. If you do a blog article, you could post it on Medium and post it on LinkedIn, the same article. So that, yeah. there's a situation where they all fit. Uh, so I think that's a totally legitimate and appropriate approach. Video so, uh, some, somewhat related to that, it, um, Torin asks about Facebook specifically, but kind of multiple groups within Facebook. He says, what happens if there are more Facebook groups for your knit for your niche uh, than you can handle? Um, and I think he's, <laughs> he's wondering kind of just as you can um, need to sort of it, prioritize channels and platforms, how do you prioritize the, the Facebook groups yeah. within Facebook? Well, first of all, that's really good that you're recognizing that it's beyond the scope of what you can handle. That is the first step to doing it right is is not trying to do something that's just 
just crushing you. So it's also much more important to be regular in one Facebook group than irregular in three or four, because they're not gonna get to know you in the three or four, you're just sporadically occasionally coming in. But the one that you're a regular in, everybody in that community is gonna know you and you're gonna be, if you're doing it right, known for offering a lot of value and helping people. Because again, you're not going in there to pitch. First of all, you'll get kicked out if you just go into pitch. But second of all, nobody is impressed by that. Nobody reacts well to that. You're going in there to, to share the to the extent you have insight and knowledge to share it to help people to answer questions to post questions that are constructive to the discussion and to post information and ideas that are constructive to what the group's all about so certainly better so you you know how much bandwidth you have and what you can do but yeah pick the ones that are most relevant most active and that you have the most fun in. If there are people there that you like and enjoy talking with, you're just gonna, it's not gonna be work. It's going to be something you enjoy doing and you're just gonna do it better. So pick the one where you fit in, you know, where it's it's your people, you know? So it, factoring in what's relevant to your target audience and, and who your client or who your product or service best serves. So you got a couple different factors to factor in, but don't underestimate the importance of you liking the community and, and enjoying the people there because that's just going to make you a, a true member of the community. Yeah, and in true August fashion, measure the outcomes of your efforts and, you know, yeah. stay nimble and if you find that one's working better than the other, then, you know, migrate allocate more of your time to that and tinker with some others. Don't be afraid to to drop one that's not working. But um and also to that point about enjoying it, that's absolutely critical because otherwise you'll burn out and in that same kind of spirit, I, I'm also careful to produce content that's going to give me an opportunity to learn something. Um, I'm always kind of exploring interest and want to stay top on the latest, tr uh, on top of the latest trends. So I'm going to, you know, force myself to research it and re kind of regurgitate what I learned through this content in order to, to keep my knowledge um, at its highest. So a few questions here, August, um, and maybe you can take this in whichever direction you want, but Nate and a few others are, are clearly familiar with your broader PPV system. And, and Nate says, how would you link sales and marketing to your knowledge vault? So I know that you said that this is kind of a standalone piece of your, of your kind of your system, but have you thought about how, how this might plug into your broader well, kind of framework yeah that's actually the most direct connection so that's the perfect question in terms of how to plug it in and that's what i opened up with with these uh, embedded list views down here i mean this is the mind expansion dashboard in three columns right so but it's all filtered for sales and marketing so it's those entries that pertain to this focus of my life or operation. So I come to this dashboard when I want to address sales and marketing, and then all of the notes and ideas, media I've captured and knowledge topic categories I've been building come with me on that page. I mean, this is an explicit direct connection to that. It's actually a pretty deep one if you think about it, it's half the dashboard. <laughs> uh, beyond that, you could be plugging it into other things like the, the place where it would be interesting to connect is the weekly and monthly reviews. Perhaps that would be where it'd be most effective to connect. So as you have the daily tracking, and again, this was a simplified version, you could beyond just checking that you did it, which is the most important thing, you could start tracking stats, like how often you did it, what the response was, that kind of stuff. At some point it becomes too much, too much of a chore and uh, sort of a false precision, but figure out what's relevant and what's helpful. And then these can roll up to your weekly review. So you would then connect this to your weekly database. And then the weekly database would roll up to the monthly database with some mirrored roll ups. But yeah, you want this stuff to roll up. So when you do your weekly review and your monthly review, you're assessing, first of all, how consistent and effective you were at executing on what you had planned to do here. And then second of all, tweaking and adjusting and figuring out what you want to change going forward in your plan and in your execution. So the, the two key connections are pulling in the knowledge vault information so that the knowledge vault items that are relevant are right there for you and you won't forget about them. They'll resurface at the right time and right place as we discussed in the last uh, Notion at Work session that I guest hosted. And then in the weekly reviews, you're assessing 
how successful were you and what you want to tweak going forward because you're constantly using this to learn and improve. The whole point is rapid iterations to get better. That's perfect. Perfect. And, um, let's see here, somewhat related in terms of relating, uh, this system, um, or interrelating this system. And, and maybe you covered this August, but, uh, Tim asked in the target contact list, do you ever expand on customer avatar or link to the product or service they would be most ideal for? If you have a wide range of services, I'm kind of assuming you have a pretty specific service, but that's a good point. You might have a, a either multiple companies or multiple services within the company. Yeah, in that case, you would definitely want to indicate what the right fit of your offering portfolio is. So we would add a new uh, multi-select and say product service. And you would then make a, a multi-select and then you just add in widget one widget two so yeah then you'll just then it's very clear that's a great thought include what is relevant to them that you offer yeah exactly i i actually use um a feature kind of like that in my own personal kind of business development process and then you can just if you want to filter the contact list by each product or service if you Perfect. only want to focus on one at a time um, so a few more questions here, and I think these will be some good ones to to end on. Is um, just kind of if if they want to learn more um, about like kind of expand on this existing system or learn more about your broader system, August, uh, what would you recommend be kind of next steps in that process? Like I said, we're going to have a follow up uh, email um, that will include link to some other sources. A few of you have mentioned. Um, kind of the integration of a conventional CRM as well, kind of like that pipeline with a uh, with a Kanban board. And um, that was kind of the approach we took in the last session. So we'll include a link to that as well. But August, where, you know, you've produced so much great content. Do you have one or two recommendations for where they could um, start taking kind of the next steps beyond this system? Yes, let me just first, uh, there's something I should mention. To, to round out the discussion, then I'll circle right back to that, which is this approach I've laid out here is really well suited if you're going through a high number of outreach and a relatively low conversion rate, uh, if you're like in the one, two, three percent, which is not unusual for sales outreach efforts. But if you're doing, if you have it such that you're closing 30% or 20%, if you have a really strong filter and the ones coming in are very well suited to begin with, what I do, what I actually do with my my actual system right now is my entire lead pipeline flow is part of the same database as my actual client database and then my former client database. So you flow from each of the lead steps, which I have fewer of than this. This is if you're reaching out cold. People come into me much more heavily filtered and much closer to ready to go. So I have fewer steps in the lead process. And then they just the toggle just changes to a client, to an active client and then eventually changes to a completed past client. So my entire client database is integrated with my lead generation and lead evaluation discussion sales database. So if you have a high close rate, you might do that. If you have a low close rate and you're just doing a large, large volume of numbers, it's kind of nice to keep this separate. And then when you get a client, move them over to your other database. So I, I meant to, to add that caveat so that might affect some of the people watching. In terms of learning more about my system in the the larger approach i obviously have a, a youtube channel that is it goes into extensive detail on the pillars pipelines and vault system it is of what's available now that is the mothership and that's totally available and the vast majority of its of the program of the system is laid out i've got a few more sections to close it out but i'm also working on a course that's going to go through and take you from a blank page from scratch all the way to a full implementation of the core system. I feel the current system that the current system definitely requires some knowledge of Notion already, so it's not as accessible for everyone, but it demonstrates what you can do with it. So once you get the basics of Notion, which are pretty easy, Notion is not that hard to pick up. What's hard to do is know how to apply it, to design the systems using it. The building blocks themselves are really pretty easy to pick up in, in a few days, week at most, you could really know how to use Notion pretty thoroughly. Uh, and, then, and then it's what do you do with it? And that's what, my YouTube channel is all about, but the course is going to take you in a much more explicit way, a much cleaner on-ramp to the whole system. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. In, in it's, the template. Uh, yeah, I have a starting my starter template starter pack gets you the first twenty percent just right out of the gate, all ready to go. Perfect. Well, that is a great point to to wrap up on. Um, and uh, I included uh, some links to August uh, on Twitter. And again, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for that follow up email um, for those of you registered here. We'll include all of those resources and an opportunity for you to suggest some future episodes. Um, and of course, we'll wel- welcome August back uh, again very soon. And in the meantime, please uh, engage with us ac- across platforms. Um, and uh, enjoy yourself implementing these great strategies. Thanks, William. This was fun.